Okay, Papa, can you hear us? Yeah, Nico. Hey. I can hear you fine. Okay, sorry, we had some small technical difficulties. No problem. Yeah, we are recording. Okay. So, Papa. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see yeah. perfectly. All right, wonderful. So I appreciate you, you know, uh, your invitation, Nico, to come and uh, to be together with you, even if it is uh, through cyberspace. <laughs> but it, uh, it's always a joy to be together with fellow strugglers in Christ. And I agreed to, to Nico's request, even though it is about 2.30 in the morning here, uh, because I firmly believe that uh, such meetings are really important. And uh, I urge you guys to not underestimate them. I remember the, uh, the admonitions of a holy monk and a zealous fool for Christ from the country of Georgia. He was speaking about 25 years ago before the fall of communism. And he stressed that in the decades ahead, it is very important for Orthodox Christians to gather together and support one another. And only with such mutual love and support can Christians survive in our, our day and age. So, uh, you know, the, the, this monk was only repeating what the Lord said when he said that uh, by your love for one another, they will know you are my disciples. So tonight, uh, I want to present more or less the same talk I gave at a banquet, at the banquet of a few weeks ago, uh, with some minor changes and additions. And as I speak to you, I hope that you'll be taking notes either in your mind or on paper and for questions, for it is in the question and answer period that I think the most benefit can come. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about being set free by truth, by the knowledge and the love of truth. Truth as a person, truth within and concerning ourselves, and truth in ideas and society. And then we can open it up for questions and answers. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah perfect. All right. So the, we all, as Orthodox Christians, have an essential oneness, you know, and that oneness is our total love for Christ. And it's a love that is above all other loves. It's the love of Christ, who is truth. And this love can be expressed in an endless way, array of ways. You know, we see this in the life of each saint, which is the story of a unique expression of this love. And everything we do as Christians should be an expression of our love for the person of Christ. Our offerings, our ascetic struggles, if they're to be efficacious and life-giving, they must be this expression of love for Christ. Any other reason is not life-creating. And that means we must go beyond religion, beyond a rash, irrational rational, rationalism that most of us are highly affected by in our society, beyond an outward piety, beyond a moralism, uh, beyond just being good men or women, to em embrace wholeheartedly the person of Christ, to be totally in love with truth. And the truth is that in our society today, we're swimming in a sea of lies on a daily basis, lies all around us about our world, about our nature, about ourselves, about our origins, about our neighbor, our country, even about God himself, perhaps more than anything about God, who God is. And we also have, though, lies within ourselves. And we're even encouraged and we're told uh, by this society, and we often acquiesce, to make idols of ourselves, to tell lies about our own selves, and to create an idol. So self-knowledge is absolutely necessary if we're going to make progress. Without it, we cannot make progress in the spiritual life. We must realize that in so much as we live and swim in these lies, or tell or believe them, or retain them within us, we're working for the enemy of our salvation, for the father of lies, who Christ said, Christ said about the father of lies, that he was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, 
He is a liar and the father of it. I'm talking, of course, about the uh, fallen angel, the devil. Now, on the contrary, the number one characteristic of a Christian is being in the truth, having clear thinking, having discernment, not being a good person, as the people define it in our society, but loving and being in the truth, understanding not only who God is, but what is going on around us in the world and in ideas and in our relationships. So to understand why this is so important, let me first say that there is truth with a capital T and there's truth with a lowercase t. Truth with a capital T, of course, is the person of Christ. And truth with a lowercase t refers to the ideas as they play out in our actions and in our relationships, in our thoughts. So the first we could say truth as a person is on the vertical plane. And the second we could say is on the horizontal plane, the truth on, in this world about ourselves, about this creation. Both truths are essential and inseparable, just like the two bars on a cross. And loving and knowing the first, Christ, enables one to discern and acquire the second truth about ourselves and about our life and our society. So loving and knowing the second, truth in the form of ideas and relationships and in society, leads one step by step closer to the first, the person of Christ, the truth who is truth himself. Now, how do we know if we love truth as a person? Christ. Well, we live in him. We acquire him. We acquire his mind. These are all the same thing. The state of being is expressed in a variety of ways, such as, according to St. Paul, the truth of Christ is in me. It speaks in me. It lives in me. And he says this continually throughout his epistles. And St. Seraphim of Serov, the great Russian saint, the ascetic, said, if we love Christ, we acquire him. And, and he said that with the following words, acquire the Holy Spirit and a thousand around you will be saved. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Truth is Christ. We say in scripture and in the saints, we say many times the same essential meaning with a thousand different ways because it's endless. The, the truth and the meaning of Christ is endless. Now Christ himself says, I am the truth. And he said this very, very important thing to Pilate. He says, for this cause, what cause? For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And so he puts down very clearly that the reason for the incarnation was the witness to himself, to reveal the truth about God, who he is. And every one of us, Everyone, rather, who is of the truth receives this witness, accepts it, he embraces it. And so Christ becomes the, uh, as we just celebrated a few days ago, the stumbling block for many and a sign to be spoken against. In Greek, we say, simeon antilegomenon. It's the sign that if you accept or you reject, it determines everything. Now, so this is the truth. If you accept the truth or you reject the truth, that's the key. That's, the, that's what reveals if you're with Christ or you're, and you're saved, you're on the path to salvation, or if you're lost, and that means not knowing the truth. So these words of Christ, that he came to reveal the truth, they illustrate the interrelation of truth as a person and truth in the realm of ideas. So this is really key. Christ came to set us free giving us to know the truth so being a christian is not please pay attention to the following it's not defined by being a good moral person alone not defined by be, by performing acts of religion it's not defined by carrying out charity work or feeding the hungry now these are all good things and christians do all that and they should do all that but that's not the defining characteristic of being a Christian. The defining characteristic is being in, as St. Paul said, and expressing, telling, and proclaiming the truth. Both truth as a person and truth 
in ourselves and in the realm of ideas. A sure sign that we love the person of Christ is that we've acquired his mind. St. Paul says these extraordinary words. He says, we have the mind of Christ. That is, we see and speak the truth. That's what he means. To have the mind of Christ means to have discernment, to be able to say, this is true, this is false. And these are the spirits of the evil one, and these are the spirit of, this is the spirit of God. And as the Apostle John says, we have the spirit to discern whether it is of God. So discernment, separating the wheat from the chaff, the lie from the truth, is the highest of virtues, and it is not acquired easily or quickly but with much labor, love, and patience. There are other virtues, you know. Many people have virtues that are almost given by God. Discernment is not like that. Discernment is attained with much struggle. And it's no wonder then that in our day, it's one of the rarest virtues, even of Orthodox Christians. And yet, this lack is a great opportunity for the church, for the truth to be heard and embraced, because you won't find discerning people, or very, very, very few, very rare, and an exception, discerning people outside of Orthodox Christians and holy Orthodox Christians. So it's a great opportunity for the Orthodox Church to speak, to witness in society to the truth, and for people who are searching to immediately sense there's something else here. Orthodox Christians have this exceptional uh, gift, and that is discerning the truth. Now, some may object that Christians shouldn't be involved in society and public life. They shouldn't be expressing or challenging those in power or ideas. But unfortunately, there are Orthodox Christians, many of them who say such things, but they're lacking discernment and they're not reading the signs of the times correctly. Listen to what Elder Paisios, the great elder of Greece, uh, has to say about this. He says, in former times, if a pious Christian was involved in public life, he probably wasn't too well. They would have considered him crazy. Today, it's the opposite. If a pious person isn't concerned and pained by the way things are in the church or in the world, he's the one who's not well. And I think the, the elders point here too, as he goes on to say, today's leaders even some in the church, unfortunately, who are, who are not representing the church well, are out to destroy, mainly he's talking about political leaders, though, are out to destroy the family, destroy the church, destroy the youth. So you can't trust them, and you can't leave matters to them as if they are benevolent and looking out for you. And secondly, the elder says, caring and witnessing to the truth in society is a form of confession of faith. And because Today's leaders are attacking the truth, attacking the faith, and attacking the church. It's a confession of faith. And, of course, confessing the faith is one of the major characteristics of all the great saints, of all the great martyrs and witnesses throughout the history of the church. Now, Elder Pisces goes on to say something else that's really important. He says, too many Christians are motivated today by self-interest and not the love of truth. They don't want to take on and remove an evil in society or even in the church so as to maintain their peace and quiet, the status quo. But you know what? This means that they don't have love. Later on, Elder Paisio says, we see these same people working hard for their own interests. And that is why a certain kind of spirit reigns today. With so-and-so, we need to have good relations. So he'll say good things about us. With others, we need to have it good so it doesn't drag us through the mud, and so on and so forth. And others keep silent. They don't talk for fear that they're going to write bad things about them or they're going to say bad things about them. So we hear here something very important. That is, that the elder equates silence and indifference, the triumph of lies and delusion in society, as a lack of love, a, lo a lack of love of the truth, that is, of Christ. So this means that our love of Christ, as, that is, of truth as a person, cannot mean that we are indifferent to truth in ideas and actions in society. It's just the opposite. If we are indifferent to truth, for instance, dogmatic truth in the church, or truth about what the teachers of the church are, uh, moral teachers of the church, if we're indifferent to those things, 
it's a sign that we don't love Christ, that we don't have love of the truth as a person. Now, the love of truth as a person is all the more a lover of truth in ideas, all the more concerned with the fate of his brothers who are mired in the, map, in the muck of lies and delusion today, all the more ready to speak a prophetic word to the world. We cannot be indifferent to the questions of our day, to the questions of truth on the horizontal plane in society, in ourselves, and think that we love truth as a person, Christ. Listen to what Apostle John says, and I think it's very, very important. He says, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he seeth, how can he love God who he doesn't see? Now, St. John, when he says he hated his brother, don't think that we're talking about what most people think about in society, and that is, you know, hate speech or racism. Not, what is, I don't think that's what the Apostle John is talking about. I think he's talking about he hated his brother. He says he loved God, but he hated his brother. What, kind of, what does this mean? It means that he's an indifferent to his brother. And, of course, the greatest thing that somebody can have in this world is truth and salvation. So the greatest indifference is indifference to the salvation of our brother. So it's a spiritual reality. It's not something so much on the mundane level of, of what most people present today in society, although those are, those are important as well. Those are important ideas that we need to speak about. So just as we cannot claim to love our, uh, our brother and be indifferent to him as he stands hungry or naked, much more we can't claim to love our brother and be indifferent to him as he is fed lies and is bereft of the truth. Christ himself said that he came to preach deliverance to the captives, to give sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So if we are his disciples and he lives in us, we imitate him. We're interested in preaching deliverance to the captives. Who is the captive today? You know, most people are not out on the streets hungry, dying from starvation in our world, in Canada, in America, in Greece today. The captives are the people who are captive to lies and delusion. Everywhere, people today are held captive to the lies in the realm of ideas. They're blind to the truth. They're enslaved. And this slavery, this blindness on the horizontal plane makes it nearly impossible for them to approach truth on the vertical plane, to draw near to Christ, to the church. So the church, you and I, must stand and speak truth to them with boldness and in a prophetic way. But that means, of course, we know the truth and we love it. So we've got a lot of work to do, first of all, right there. Now, the boldness means, does not necessarily mean that, as Elder Paisio says, the unbeliever or the heterodox person or whoever, even in the church, will uh, not be uneasy. In fact, a good uneasiness is a good sign. It's a necessary and beneficial uneasiness, which awakens the conscience and brings the soul to salvific knowledge. A lot of people don't want to, you know, offend and that's good we want to always have a good way and be very calm and peaceful but the reality, reality is that many of us need to wake up and that waking up is not easy it's a uneasy feeling in the beginning so if you and i know the truth as a person we will easily know and understand truth in ideas and if those outside the church love truth in the realm of ideas and come to know them they will be that much be nearer to accepting truth as a person. See how those two go together? And that we cannot be indifferent to one and, the, uh, and love the other, just like the Lord, we can't be indifferent to our brother and say we love God. Now, our world today is totally indifferent, almost totally indifferent to truth as a person and the person of Christ. More and more people uh, are distancing themselves to even in an interest in finding the truth. And they're confused or even blind to tr truth in the realm of ideas. So if there is hope that our brothers and sisters outside the church will come to the truth of the person, to the church, the body of Christ, which is the body of truth, which uh, uh, it will be largely because 
his disciples shine in, the, in word and deed the light of truth, both as a person and in the realm of ideas, leading them from darkness of ignorance to the knowledge of the Son of God. Listen to what St. Paul says about the Christians of the last times. And he gives us criteria and very instructive and revealing teaching that will help us. He says that the spirit of delusion works, quote, with all deception of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that might be saved. So in, in conclusion, clearly St. Paul has the love of truth as a criterion of salvation. And in the kingdom of lies, in which we live all today, all of us, the love of truth is the key to heaven. And this is absolutely going contrary to the whole mentality, uh, you know, on television and in, in most people's lives, where truth is really just not even an issue. It's all about uh, our our own particular interests, getting ahead on a material plane. Uh, that's what's going to set us as Orthodox Christians apart, is that we have, first of all, love of truth. Now, before I close, I want to turn back to something that we touched upon earlier, which is very timely for us, and that is that the love of truth as it pertains to our own selves, knowing ourselves, which in Greek is aftonosia, aftonosia, knowledge of ourselves. And we just entered the period of the Triodian, and soon Great Lent will begin. A large part of our struggle during Great Lent is acquiring this aftonosia, this coming to know ourselves. So let me say two words about this, and then I want to open it up to questions. There are, I suppose, two kinds of knowing ourselves. The first is knowing man or human nature for every human and every person. And then the second one is knowing the particular person that I am, knowing myself, the particular person. Both of these are necessary if we're going to come to aftonosia, knowledge of ourselves. One helps the other. So knowing man generally in human nature requires that we read the Bible and we read the Holy Fathers, the church. It means we know what katikona and kathomiusi mean, or in English, according to the image and according to the likeness. Now, this is from Genesis, where it said that man was created according to the image and likeness of God. Now, this is really, really important to understand what that means. If you don't understand what that means, you don't understand what Christ did when he came to earth in his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, and his second coming. So it means we got to know what katikona, according to the image, kathomiosin, according to the likeness, what this means. We can talk about that in the question and answer period, if you like. It means also that we know who the person of Christ is, for he is the prototype. Now, what is katikona and omiosin? It's that we're according to the image and likeness of Christ. He is the prototype. And it also means that we know who we were created to be, how we fell, and what it did to us, how Christ restored man, and what this restoration means, or in other words, what salvation really means. Now, salvation or restoration, healing, doesn't mean keeping the law, but having a life in the spirit. It doesn't mean being good boys and girls. Having a moral life it means becoming holy. It's very different. It means being set apart. That's what holiness means. And it means becoming like God. It's like the Lord said, ye are God. Those are amazing words. What does it mean? How can he say the word God? Of course, it's a small g. Right? There's only one God. So what does he mean there? It means becoming like him. Like Christ. That's why he came to this earth, to make him, make us like him. Now, knowing the particular person, we said we talked about knowing man and the purpose of man and what the nature of man is. The second part of 
self knowledge. What we're going to do now in 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 San Agustí in in great length and already in the trilogy, and what they're going to talk about in the text is come to know ourselves. Not only that, but a lot of what we're doing in in great length is coming to know ourselves. Now, the second part I said is the particular person who I am. Now we just heard in the gospel on Sunday in the public and in the Pharisee about this whole self-knowledge. We saw one person who uh, saw himself as he was, and he neither raised his eyes to God or to his fellow man, and that was the publican. We saw another person who was blind to himself. He had created an image, an idol of himself, and he judged his brother. That's a person who does not have self-knowledge. Another part of, of obtaining self-knowledge in, in, in terms of my particular person is confession, going to confession, making a good confession, but not just the, not just the mystery of confession, because confession doesn't just happen when you go in and you sit down with the priest. If, you're, if you think that's going to happen, if you're going to be ready to, and make a good confession, from the moment you go in and sit down with him, you're very mistaken. Confession means we watch over ourselves. Our words and our thoughts, even our movements, our impulses, our glances, and our desires. So when we go, when we keep a good confession, we're going to have a booklet that we're going to keep with us, and we're going to write down our falls, not just our external falls, but our falls in thought, our our falls in deed and in word. We're going to watch over ourselves. Nipsi in Greek. We're going to have Needs to, what is going on in ourselves? This whole universe. St. Nicodemus says that man is a larger, more expansive universe than the whole created universe. So there's a whole universe inside us waiting for us to discover. This is self-knowledge. This is aftonosia. And this happens when we're watchful, nipsy, over ourselves. You know, living a life of the church, which is of its nature an ascetic life, that's what this is all about. Ascetic life is not about the external keeping the fast only. That all leads us to aftonosia. The life we lead more intensely during Great Lent as a kind of training ground for the whole year will naturally lead to greater and greater degrees of self-knowledge. For example, when the fast comes and I struggle to give up the beloved food of mine, and I can't very easily give it up, I learn something about myself. My true self is partially revealed, and I'm illumined. I understand more. You know, a lot of times we talk about illumination, and I don't know what people think illumination is. Maybe it's something far off, we're going to see a light. No, illumination is knowing ourselves, seeing ourselves, discovering who we are, and you know what? It's pretty ugly, full of passions. And if we want to really learn about ourselves, it's not easy. So that's illumination. Illumination is, is, is knowing ourselves and, of course, even more importantly, knowing God. And let me give you another example from, from Great Lent or from, from the struggle, the ascetic struggle. When prayer is intensified or doubled, as the monks do in the monastery during Great Lent, and I'm negligent, I'm lazy, I don't get to it in time, well... I learn a lot about myself, don't I? See how weak I am. And the truth is revealed. I'm a slave and I'm not free. So the ascetic life means coming to knowledge of ourselves, revealing who we are. When a man is set free from delusion about himself, see himself, and about man generally, as he truly is, he is in the process of purification and illumination, and he's preparing an abode for the truth to come and dwell within him, for the light to dwell within him, to become illumined. With Christ, who is truth's abode in us, we are saved from delusion, which is spiritual death. In other words, when Christ comes and abides in us, that's truth coming and abiding in us, we're saved from delusion, which is a spiritual death, and 
we go already in this life from death to eternal life. You know, eternal life is not after the grave. We don't start living in the eternal life of God after the grave. If we do, if we think that and we're waiting for that moment to happen after we're dead, we're going to wake up to a very problematic experience. Because the Holy Father say, if we don't live it in this life, we're not going to live it in the next life. And of course, there are a million stages and a million levels of that existence, but we've got to begin it in earnest in this life if we're going to continue it in the next. So to conclude, coming to know ourselves, in other words, the truth about ourselves, aftonosia, is absolutely crucial if we're going to be able to draw near to Christ and to know him as he is, which is theognosia, aftonosia, Theognosia, knowledge of ourselves, is going to lead to knowledge of God. Those two go together. They're not separate. This knowledge of truth is salvation. That's what it means to be saved. We know Christ. And to know Christ, we got to know ourselves because we're made in his image and likeness. So with that, let me end because I said a lot. It's a lot. It's very, a lot of these meanings are very deep. Uh, I don't want to challenge you to... Think about some of this. Take even one thing and, you know, let's talk about it. Let's discuss it. You can ask as many questions as you like. And uh, I leave it open to you. I hope this was uh, helpful.